All right, this is Patrick Rogers. Today we have the privilege to have Justin Quinn on the show, and Justin is the CEO of Focus on Machining. Welcome to the show, Justin. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You bet, man. So a little bit about Justin. He began his professional career in the Air Force, where he spent six years as an aircraft mechanic on the C-17. As a flight mechanic, he traveled the world with a toolbox and laptop and ensured the aircraft remained operational in obscure locations like Afghanistan, Iraq, and even Antarctica. So uh, before we move on, thank you for your service, Justin. Very, very much appreciate it. Um, and I can see your, your uh, kind of your shadow box in the back there. So yeah. good stuff. <clears throat> he then separated from the Air Force to pursue a bachelor's degree uh, at the University of Northern Colorado, where he graduated with honors from the Monfort College of Business with a bachelor's degree in, in BA and an emphasis in finance. After graduation, did a few internships in finance, but ended up with Centennial Bank, where he worked for over five years as a commercial banker. While he was there, he also attended the University of Colorado Denver and got his MBA. Strong interest in manufacturing in 2016, he acquired Focused on Machining, where he's currently the president. He manages day-to-day -day operations, business development, and strategic planning for the business. Since he's owned the company, interestingly enough, they've grown over 300% in the last four years with the addition of many new customers, pieces of equipment. Their primary growth sectors have come from aerospace, defense, and medical, uh, and they continue to see growth opportunities with both new and existing customers. So Justin, I can't wait to dive in and talk about your acquisition, talk about the things that you've been able to do in your company to get the growth curve that you've been able to achieve. Before we do that, um, what's one interesting fact about yourself that maybe not many people know? So uh, one of the things that's unique to us and our family is uh, we live in a, a multi-generational home. Uh, so we built a new home a couple of years ago, um, an attached mother-in-law suite. Uh, uh -huh. So we've got our parents living with us. Uh, I've got a niece living with us and, and a sister-in-law. So it's a pretty good sized house, uh, but we all have our own space. Um, and there's eight of us total. And it's just, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, journey having everybody together under one roof. Yeah, it's like a family reunion every day. That's right. <laughs> I can see that would be <clears throat> wonderful on many aspects and, and and probably a little challenging on a few others. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. The, the individual spaces really helps with the challenging side. You know, we yeah. can all do our own thing and be in the house okay. at the same time. But uh, the kids love having the grandparents there. Uh, you know, they're so helpful when when a kid is sick or some point, something, you know, they can stay home with the grandparents or if we have deliveries or something, you know, it's just, it's been very handy having everybody there. Awesome. Awesome. So, so tell us about this. You were, you were getting, you know, you got your MBA, excuse me, you got your, 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 your business degree in um, your bachelor's degree in business and you were working for uh, centennial as a yep. commercial banker. What was the mindset or what brought you to, to go from being a commercial banker to uh, manufacturing? It was honestly kind of a, a misfit for me being in banking. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I was in the Air Force for six years, uh, flight mechanic, you know, traveling world, working on aircraft. I, um, you know, for those of us that have served in the military, there's a camaraderie amongst each other. Uh, it's really hard to find outside of the military. You know, we go through very stressful situations. Uh, we're put in, into these things with people we've never met and you kind of shake hands and then you just get going and you start working and uh, it's an unbelievable level of trust. Um, and so I, I really missed that when I got out of the the military and banking had none of that. Right. It was, mm -hmm. a, yeah. you know, I mean, we, it was, we had our, our loan sales goals. Transactional. Yeah. yeah. Transactional. We tried to develop relationships, but I mean, does anybody have a real strong relationship with their bank? I don't, I don't think so. Not anymore. Um, and so while I was a banker, I had a lot of customers in manufacturing and every time I would go and visit them, visit the facilities, you know, learn about their business. It just reminded me so much of the military, you know, it's, it's blue collar, uh, it's a trade, right? So a lot of the employees are not college graduates. They're just hardworking Americans, you know, that want to provide for their family and, uh, it just reminded me so much of the military. And so I started getting involved in the trade association as a banker um, and really started to meet more and more people and, and really just started to fall in love with the industry more and more. Um, and I always wanted to own my own business. Um, you know, I have an entrepreneurial family, a um, couple uncles own businesses have been very successful. So I've always wanted to own my own business. I just never knew what. 
Um, and, mm -hmm. and once I kind of stumbled upon manufacturing and then had the background of the, the degrees and the banking experience, um, it just kind of gave me the confidence to pursue it. So, so inside that trade association, I just started asking around and said, Hey, you know, I'm thinking of jumping in. I'm thinking of, of buying a shop and, and running it. And, uh, boy, I just started getting introduced into all kinds of people. And, uh, one thing led to another and ended up here in late 2016. Cool. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about that acquisition. What, um, was it, did you do like an SBA loan? Was it an owner financing? Was there earn out type stuff? Like, let's talk about. Yeah, it was, setup. it was owner financing. Um, oh, wow. you know, uh, that was pretty crucial to me at that point. Um, you know, I getting bank financing was not likely going to happen. Um, just because I was an outsider to the industry. I didn't have experience to the industry. Um, the size of company I was looking at buying, you know, typically, didn't have a lot of strong finances, didn't have a lot of, you know, good operational procedures. I mean, I was really looking to buy a small shop that, that it was kind of just a guy and a couple guys running it together and they were just getting by, you know, doing the best they could every day kind of thing. So it, it didn't look great on paper and hmm. to get a bank to say, yes, we'll give you the money to do this. It just wasn't going to happen. happen. So yeah. I, I really was pursuing something where the owner would be willing to to carry the, the loan. And that's that's how this deal worked out. I um I actually took out a line of credit on my house, gave him a big down payment, and then he carried the rest back. Okay. What what percentage um did he carry? Um he carried, I'd say 75, I think 75%. Wow. Okay. I gave him like a 20, 25% down payment. Um, and he carried the ma majority of it back. That's pretty hard to find. Um, yeah. But but in this case, it sounds like it, things weren't really that, you know, it wasn't cash flowing maybe that well, or, or was it, was it not, would, would, it, would you not consider it a very successful business at the time? Or? No, it was, it was successful. It just, you know, not by means that a bank or anybody else would consider, you know, I mean, this guy had started it from scratch, um, from, okay. from nothing and, yeah. and built it up, you know, to, um, I think there were, there were eight employees when I took it over and they were doing about 700,000 in revenue. Uh -huh. Um, the two years prior to that, they had grown, um, they'd done like 1.1 and then 1.4 and then down to 700. Oh, he was kind of um, going in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the reasons, another reason why it wasn't going to be financed through, through, uh, Oh yeah. The bank's going to be but, like, uh, this is a sinking ship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, there's a lot to understand about that and to learn why and what was going on. Um, and I understood that. Um, but the, the owner, you know, he, he was a seasoned vet in the industry. He had worked in manufacturing for 25 plus years. He left manufacturing to go do some other stuff and then came back. And that's when he started his own shop. So he was late in his career. He was in his fifties, you know, coming up on 60 years old. So when the business started to have struggles and, and, and he, you know, he couldn't rely on, on word of mouth and the customers he had built, he, he just didn't have the energy and the drive to go out and, and find a whole new customer base. Whereas myself in my early thirties, you know, I had all the energy in the world and that's what I wanted to do. So yeah. it, it really, and, and, and I'll tell you, it, it took me a year and a half to actually find this business. I made it sound like it happened quick, but it was a, a year and a half journey. And I okay. visited many shops and I wrote offers on other shops and we just never, ever came to agreement. This just happened to work out because he was looking for an exit, something, you know, something to move on. And, and I was looking to jump in. So it just, it really worked out for both of us. And he awesome. really liked the idea of getting a monthly check. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I showed him the numbers. And I showed him, you know, if I pay you cash, this is what you're going to get today. If I pay, if you carry this loan, you know, I'm going to pay you interest and this is what you'll earn over the life of the loan. And so he really liked that. He really liked the idea of I'm going to get a check every single month and I'm going to make more on this business than if I sold it just outright because of the interest. Yeah. Well, fantastic. That's awesome that you were able to make a win-win like that. Yeah. Um, and that's encouraging too, for the listeners, you know, people that, that, you know, we always think that there's only one way to buy a business and that's, you know, through SBA or, you know, through a loan. And there are people out there who are open to the idea of a significant carry. Absolutely. Especially 
you know, guys that or I shouldn't say guys, but people that might not be well set for retirement, you know, maybe they have a little bit of 401k, they don't have a pension. So if you're offering them a, a five, 10 year buyout where they're going to get a check every month, it kind of turns into a little retirement plan for them. Totally. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. So so walk us through your journey since uh, when you bought it. What, what are the things that you were able to do to get this 300 uh, percent growth curve uh, in what, geez, four or five years? Yeah. So that, the, you know, the growth curve was actually, you know, very hockey stick like, right. Like the first two, three years was growth, but, but not strong growth. And then, and then we hit, you know, kind of a point where it just ramped through the roof. Um, and the reasons were when I took it over, no business systems, no processes in place mm-hmm. at all. I mean, it was, okay. it was a couple Excel spreadsheets, um, some, some paper forms that we would fill out when we got POs. And then we would literally just go out to the shop floor and be like, Hey guys, we got this order. We need to make these parts. And, you know, it was just total manual going at it and and just, you know, every day was a fight and a battle and just trying to get more done than you had the day before. Um, So that was my first task was to implement business systems, um, Mm. starting with an ERP system, right. Uh, system that managed our orders, um, that we could schedule, that we could control the information. Um, being in manufacturing, you know, we make parts that often have never been made before by anybody. So there's a lot of stuff we have to do to figure out. And there's a ton of opportunity for miscommunication in that process. So I bet. implementing an ERP system was huge for us to not only organize the shop and organize the flow of work, but to capture that communication and to you know, better prepare the shop floor. That way, when they're ready for their next job, the next part, they don't have to spend an hour or hours or days figuring it out. We've already done that ahead of time and they just got to follow the instructions we've laid out to them. So that was big task number one. I I did that within the first, I purchased a system within the first three months of me owning the business and then took another four or five to implement. So I'd say, you know, six to eight months to implement the ERP system. Um, and then, and then we, uh, we also got a, a certification an industry certification, which is important in manufacturing. Um, it kind of sets you, um, above, uh, other shops. And so that was an ISO 9001 cert, which is a, a quality certification. Um, basically an outside auditor will come in, audit your business practices and your processes, um, and, and basically certify that you are a quality shop. You can you can perform and deliver at a high level of quality because you have all of these processes in place. Um, and so we got that cert kind of that same time frame, um, And that was the big number one step to really get the business to be a business and not just, you know, somewhere where we came every day and we just kind of dealt with the stacks of paper that we had on our desk kind of thing. So just implementing business systems, And then from there, we really started to build out the proper team, right? I mean, when I took it over, it was the owner and then just a bunch of guys on the shop floor that, you know, would just wait for him to tell them what to do and then they would go. Um, And so after we implemented systems, we did a lot of training and okay, here's how you know what to do next. Don't wait for me to tell you, go look at the schedule. Here's your, you know, here's your bin of queued work. Here's how you know what to do next. And the expectation is, is when you're done with this job, you immediately go to the next thing and you never stop. There's no, you know, not that there's no downtime, there's no breaks, there are breaks, but you should, sure. if you're not on break, you should be actively working on the next thing or moving forward on something. Um, and so a lot of training and then, and then developing, you know, when I say developing the team, kind of developing layers and, and a hierarchy, right? So it's mm-hmm. not just myself. So we, we hired a, a general manager um, who he his task was to really manage the shop floor and then help with the technical challenges and issues. That way I could focus on business development, improving the business, business processes, that that type of thing. So um, we we worked in this environment for about a year. Um, and and me, you know, in the meanwhile, I was learning the industry every day, right? Like I I had a very good level of understanding due to my air force career about parts and, and part numbers and, and how things are made and how things go together. But I still was very green in the industry. So 
as I continued to learn about the industry, I, I gained confidence and I got ideas about how I wanted to change this business and grow it and move it. Um, and so because of that, myself and that general manager kind of parted ways, you know, he wanted to run the shop one way. And as I gained experience, I wanted to take it another direction. So we, we parted ways and I promoted one of my younger guys off the floor um, into that GM role. And that was kind of a big bump for us. You know, we did, um, I, I took over the shop. It was like 650, 700 in revenue. And, you know, we maybe did 800 that, that first year. Um, yeah. And then the next year we kind of eclipsed the 1 million mark. Um, and so when we, when we changed GMs, you know, the younger guy I promoted off the floor had only worked at this shop. So he was really gung ho about growing the business and, and taking it the direction I wanted to take it. And so once we made that transition, we bumped up a little bit and then we, we grew for a couple of years. We continued to grow the team. We bought new equipment. We upgraded the equipment that we had. We had a lot of old used CNC machines, yeah. um, still did great, but because we got our ISO certification and because I was out there developing new business, some of the work that was coming in was outside of our capabilities with these older machines. So the next two and a half, three years was all about upgrading the shop floor and, and, in, you know, including training the employees, but mostly upgrading the equipment to meet the demands of today's parts. Um, and so that, that took us from, you know, 1.1 million to, to 1.5 over wow. the next few years, yeah, yeah. Um, just doing that. And then, and then I kind of decided to tear the whole thing down and start, start over. Um, you know, I realized that the ERP system I had bought was great, but not anywhere near what I had wanted, right? It took care of a lot of things, but there were a ton of things that were still outside of the ERP system that we had to do manually. We had to create our own forms. And, um, and so, my desire was to have an all encompassing system really from, from, you know, PO to shipping, it covers everything. And in manufacturing quality is a huge aspect of what we do. You know, now, now we're, we're putting parts on rockets. We're putting parts on outer space. We're, we're de delivering parts wow. to the military. So it's, it's serious stuff and quality is no joke. Um, and, and that wasn't encompassed in my previous ERP system. So I really went looking for a new ERP system that encompassed quality um, because I wanted to go to the next level on certification. I wanted to take that ISO 9001 cert and bump it up to AS9100. And what AS9100 is, it's the aerospace certification that allows you to make parts for, for Boeing or any defense right. contractor, anything that flies in the air or has people on it, you need to have that certification. Um, and because I developed ISO all by myself, written policy, I knew that I didn't want to do that again with AS9100 because it was ISO on steroids. So right, right. Um, we went out, um, I, I found a couple ERP systems. Um, I, I really found one that was developed especially for machine shops around AS9100, just really geared for a machine shop at the level I wanted to be at. Um, and it actually took me a while to purchase it because it almost seemed too good to be true. Mm. You know, every time I would do a demo with them, I was like, God, man, it just where's the catch, right? Like, where's the, where's the, the pitfall that I'm going to fall into kind of thing. So it took me a long time to actually purchase this. Um, I, I still joke around with the people at the software company now that I, I really put them through the ringers. You know, I made them do tons of demos for me and really proved to me that it could do all the things they said it could. Um, so long story short, bought the, the new ERP system. Um, and it took me probably six months to implement that. Um, you know, we, we, one, the system was way more robust. So the training time for me took a lot longer. I had to learn a lot more about the system. Yeah. Um, and then I trained my team as I was being trained. So mm. Once a week, I would go up in front of the, the shop. We had a big, we have a big screen in the shop and I would just kind of give them a presentation, um, uh, like a PowerPoint presentation or show them videos and say, okay, guys, this is months out, but it's coming. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the ERP system we're going to go to. And we just started working through it section by section. Here's wow, yeah. how you're going to go in and look at your work order. Here's how you know what to do next. 
here's how you complete the work order. And I just showed them that as I did it. And then uh, we picked a go live date. Uh, we went, you know, live January one, um, uh, a few years ago. Yep. And so once we went live, it took me, you know, three weeks of just being on the shop floor nonstop and answering questions and helping navigate and just dealing with the, you know, the, the, the new system questions, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, where's this button? Where do I go for that? So three weeks, just on the shop floor straight, just help and answer questions. Um, and then one of the things that I did that I think was super successful in implementing this system is I created a uh, reward competition, right? So, so one of the, one of the differences between our new system and our old system mm -hmm. is the new system really wanted feedback from the guys on the floor on, on issues, on, on how to, you know, cause we pre plan the job, but yeah. Nothing goes perfectly to plan ever. So the difference between what we planned and what happened in reality needs to be captured. And so I, I created a competition for the, all the employees. And I said, whoever can document the work order the best in these next four weeks, you know, most detail. I mean, we're talking uploading pictures of the setup. We're talking detailed descriptions, calculations, you know, I, I told them, you know, I'm not a machinist. I don't run machines. I can't run machines. So I told them your details should be so good that I can come here and follow your instructions and make a part without knowing how to do anything else. So that was kind of the task. Um, and, and so we let it run for four weeks and uh, I did a cash prize. You know, I said the, the winner will get uh, a two, $200 cash prize, right? Whoever can do the best thing over the next four weeks we'll do 200 dollars. So they're, they're creating processes and procedures for what they're doing absolutely but absolutely. that's the key they're doing it not you <laughs> that's that's right they're doing it on their own free will instead of me dictating it down to them what a great so, idea yeah yeah we went four weeks and i tell you what i was so blown away with how good the whole shop did that i gave everybody a hundred dollar bill and I paid the one person that had just a little bit better, the $200 cash prize. So it ended up That's costing awesome. me like 2000 bucks, but I tell you what, it was so well worth it. It was yeah. money well spent because right. now those habits that they developed in that first month are still habits we're doing three, you know, three and a half years later now. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Um, how to turn around a manufacturing company 101 right there. That, <laughs> that's great. That's fantastic. I had a quick question for you. Yeah. And, um, because that, that was so much great information there. When you were kind of talking about building out the proper team, um, you're kind of, you're going back to the guys, <clears throat> the guys that were there, right. Their culture was, uh, the old owner would come in and tell them what to do. And, and all of a sudden there's a new, there's a new guy in town. How hard was it to, to get, you know, cause right. Old dog, new tricks, right. Yeah. How hard yeah. was it to change that mindset and, and culture to, to where you wanted to take them? I would honestly say not that difficult. Okay. And, yeah, they probably and I would appreciate say, it. I would say that because of the type of people, right? Like this, these are the people that brought me to this industry, hardworking people just yeah. want to provide for their family. Love it. And so that was, that was the messaging I continued to, to spew out to the shop, right? Is like, guys, I, we're going to change some stuff. Things are going to be different. I don't want to make your job harder. I don't want to make it more difficult, but I want to allow this business to do more work and to have higher sales, higher profits, you know, raises for you all. Um, and, and the way we do that is by being more efficient. And we have to do, we have to change the system and we have to change the way we do things so we can be more efficient and do more in the same square foot than we did last month, last year. Um, and so I just continually kind of push that and, 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 and their feedback back to me was, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll do anything you want is, is, you know, as long as you keep us busy and you keep our families fed and you can raise, raise our, our, our pay rates and this company grows we're, we're here to, 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 you know, walk this line with you kind of thing. Um, and that was just kind of the mentality I, I had. And it was, you know, we, we need, we need to do this for all of ourselves, right? We all want to make more money. We all want to provide for our family. And the only way to do that is to keep, continue to grow the business. And, and so the business makes more money and we can pass down to everybody else. 
Um, Got it. Yeah, I love it. That, that was really the messaging. And I really, really didn't have a lot of, of struggle. Um, you know, I mean, there was definitely fallout. We lost a couple people um, that, that just weren't progressing. That was the main reason we lost people is because they weren't progressing. They had gotten to a level um, in their career and then they kind of flatlined and they, sure. and then as I pushed, right, as I pushed harder parts, more difficult parts, you know, it, it pushed them to learn and to do things differently than they've had in the past. And, and that was kind of the breaking point. They either de decided, okay, I'm going to continue to learn and get better or I'm not, I don't, not. I don't want to, I'm happy with where I am. And then that's, that's where we had some of the departures. Uh, but I would say they were very amical departures. You know, it was, Hey, you know, the direction the company's going is, is not, you know, how I saw it. And um, I know you want to take it there and I don't fault you for that. And and then likewise from me down, I said, you know, I, I, I'll help you find another. I mean, I, I know a lot of people in this industry and know a lot of other shops I'd be happy to make calls for you and place you at a shop that's a better fit for you. So it was just a very, you know, I maintain awesome. that, that working yeah, yeah. relationship as much as possible. Yeah, high integrity. Very good. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. take a few minutes, Justin, and summarize some of my key takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> really, what, what this uh, episode turned into is really how to turn around, and specifically how you turned around man your manufacturing facility. And the first thing you did was you identified a gap in systems. Um, there was, it was yeah. very much owner involved. It was very much nothing happened until the owner came in and told everybody what to do. They were, you know, it was very, very codependent. So you created, uh, implemented an ERP system right away within three to four months, yeah. total six, to eight months to implement that saved a massive amounts of time. I'm sure efficiency, uh, yeah. just all around. Number two, you got industry certification, right? If you're in yeah. manufacturing and you don't have ISO, um, it's kind of an industry standard, right? So yeah. uh, that allowed you to get in, get, get open up the doors into new places, have more, uh, have more clout. Um, next, you kind of worked on building out your proper team, getting the team trained up um, okay. and, and, and give them that independence empowerment that they didn't have before. And, and you implemented some layers and hierarchy. Uh, then you worked on upgrading equipment, upgrading uh, even better ERP system going after the AS9100. And then I love this reward competition that you did. I think that's for me, that's like my, my, the coolest takeaway. I've not heard of somebody doing that. Um, we, you know, there's companies that and clients that I've had, well, okay, yeah, we we'll, you know, we we'll get your, get your team to create the process and procedures, but you took that a step further. You created this reward and competition and made it fun kind of. And, yeah. uh, and allowed them to own it versus you hiring another company to come in or just anything like that. So, um, Hey, Justin, if there was uh, one takeaway that you'd really want the audience to absorb uh, upcoming leaders and CEOs from our time together today, what would that be? You know, I would say to continually think about how you can improve every process from, from beginning to end. Um, I, I guarantee you there's, there's waste, there's lost time, there's inefficiencies somewhere in, in your value chain, right? In, in, in the process you do at your business. So find ways to improve it. And the one way you can do that successfully is by, by having the team be part of that and help you develop that. You know, one of the thing I tell when we're working on a process or implementing a new process, I always tell the team members that I'm working with, the ones that will have to do this process day in, day out, I tell them, I will never tell you how to do this job but here are the confines we have to do it under, right? If, if it's, let's say it's um, like our inspection process, right? Where a machinist makes a part, send it into inspection, and they have to verify that part before that machinist can make a new one. So the confines of that is you have to be ultra responsive. That machine is waiting. That machinist is waiting on you to tell them, hey, everything's good to go. You can go ahead and run. Or it's not good, make some adjustments, make another, bring it back. So when we developed this first article inspection process, the confines I gave to my quality team was you have to respond within 30 minutes, right? They bring up a part to you. You've got to get it into quality and respond to them within 30 minutes. That gives them time to maybe take a quick, you know, bathroom break, uh, organize their area. And by that time you're getting a response and they can be back on the machine working. So that was the confine I gave to them. And I say, you can develop any type of system you want, any workflow you want, but that's what we have to try to achieve. That's the goal we have to achieve. And what, 
what came out of that was my my inspectors created these bright pink cards that we laminated a full eight and a half by 11 page said part ready for first article inspection and then we built a shelf inside the quality room and we labeled it with that same color first article inspection shelf so now they're doing their normal day-to-day -day operations they're doing their normal stuff but when when they see a part show up on that shelf with that bright pink tag on it they know immediately that's a 30 minute part i gotta jump to that right now get to it get back to the shop floor and that's kind of one of the processes that you know i let the team develop their own but i gave them the confine that i wanted them to operate under with responding within 30 minutes and yeah, then you guys figure yeah. out how to do it but here's what has to happen exactly somehow. exactly cool. awesome yeah. Well, Justin, uh, awesome to have you on the show. If, the, if there are um, any of our listeners that wanted to reach out and get a hold of you for any follow-up questions, what's the best way they could do that? You know, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So find me Perfect. on LinkedIn, uh, Justin Quinn. Um, you can also find us under Focused on Machining. And cool. then, um, you know, I always tell people, feel free to email me. My email address is jquinn at focusedonmachining.com. Very good. Uh, awesome, Justin. Thanks for being on the show. This was a fantastic episode. You really walked us through your complete journey end to end on turning around your shop and, and, and positioning it for growth. So thanks for being on the show, man. No problem. I really appreciate it. All right. And for the listeners out there, please hit the like and subscribe button and help us spread the word about what we're doing. We're helping the next generation of CEOs and leaders be that much more successful. With that, this is your host, Patrick Rogers, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks a lot.